1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you excited? Boy, I've never seen such excitement in my life. Yesterday, yesterday, I went over to the ball field when we got back because there was tournaments going on in the girls' junior softball league. Fast pitch. And we've got some young ladies here. Uh, Kelly Balsharek, her team, took first place in the city for the season. We've got Miss Julia Parsons back there. Her team took second place in the overall tournaments yesterday. And Caitlin Trimmer's in the nursery. Her team took first place in the overall tournaments yesterday. But they started early yesterday morning in the hot, broiling sun. And they played. And they played. And they played. I think Julia played three games back to back and finished up about five, no, about eight o'clock last night or something like that. And played three games back to back in that hot, broiling sun. And I got to that ball field and the bleachers were full of mothers and fathers and friends and a couple of old grandparents. And as I was there watching, someone had mentioned to me not long ago, says, why don't you coach a little league team? And as I watched those parents yesterday jump all over the coach, the umpire, and everybody else that was in shouting distance, I thought to myself, that's why. I want you to know parents get excited. And buddy, if you call their child out, unless they were out by 20 steps, you're wrong. Because they're excited about that. And when their child crosses home plate, they're excited. And I, you know, just a walk, the child walks, and it's the most exciting thing. Hey, good job, that's as good as a hit. Those folks were excited out there yesterday over one little old ball game. And then it came down at 5.45 to the championship between the Diamondbacks and the Marlins. And, buddy, they screamed the whole time. Those kids were in the dugout doing cheers. They've been out there all day in the hot sun doing cheers for each other, running back and forth off of that field, high-fiving one another over a ball game. And then we come to God's house, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that's coming back one day to take us to glory. And I say, are we excited? And one person says, yes. <laughs> Don't it make you wonder what we get excited about? My friends, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to take his children home for eternity. I don't know about you, but that's a long time. I'm excited about that. I love to get together and worship. I love to get together with church people. We had a wonderful time yesterday canoeing and fellowshipping together and eating on the sandbar, one bite of chicken, one bite of sand. We had a good time fellowshipping together. And it's an exciting thing to be able to get together with God's people and just to worship and to fellowship. But I can't even fathom in my little miniature brain what it's going to be like when he takes us home to glory, I'm just trying to imagine what glory is going to be like. And I can't imagine the extent of what it's going to be like, but just a little bit I can imagine I'm excited about it. And I'll tell you, I'm ready to go. I am ready for him to come. If he would come at this very moment, I'd be like old John that said, even so, Jesus, come on. That's paraphrased. He said, even so, Lord Jesus, come. In today's vernacular, I say, come on, Jesus. It's time to go home. This old world has become so rotten. If you watch television, if you go to a movie, if you just stand on the street or go to a restaurant or anywhere and listen to the language, listen to what people are bragging about or excited about, my friends, this old world has pure rotted. My Lord must be so sad at what has happened once again, at the Sodom and Gomorrah that America has become. And one day he's going to come back. And my friend, I don't think it can be much longer. And today I want to talk about the manner 
of His coming for just a few moments because we believe He's going to come back. And I just want us to think about how He's going to do it. It's going to be personal. I don't know about you, but I love things to be done personal. Maybe it's a little pride, maybe something else, I don't know. But I don't like to be turned over to someone down the chain. You know, when you think you're going to meet with somebody and they set up an appointment with you and then you get there and they say, well, the president couldn't be here and the vice president couldn't be here and their assistants couldn't be here, but I'm the janitor, may I help you? That doesn't sit well with me. I thought I was going to see the head person and, and I didn't get to see the head person. But I want you to know that Jesus isn't sending anyone back. He's coming himself. He's not going to send an archangel. He's not going to send a representative. He's not going to send Peter, Paul, or John. He's coming back himself. It's going to be a personal thing. I'm not looking for anybody but Jesus because he said he's coming. He said in John 14, 3, If I go and if I prepare a place for you, I will come and take you to be with me. Isn't that good news? He's going to come himself. Revelation 22, 12 says, Behold, I come quickly. First Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven. My friends, I'm not looking for anybody else. I'm not looking for a substitute, not looking for a stand-in, because there's nobody coming for me but Jesus Himself. So I praise the Lord that although at times here on this earth I may be let down, I will not be let down the day that Jesus comes back because He's coming Himself. In person, You know, some people say, well, a lot of these things are just theory or it's just a metaphor. But my friend, it's literal. He said in Luke 24, 39, it is I myself. Handle me. See me for the spirit hath not flesh and bones as you have seen me. He's coming back literally. It's not going to be an apparition. It's not going to be something we're going to dream or think about. He is physically, literally going to come out of that sky and he's going to meet his children. Boy, I'm excited to know that those that have already passed on, we've got a lot of loved ones in this cemetery out here. Many of us have loved ones scattered around. My, my father's buried in the cemetery there in North Carolina. Becky's brother is buried in a cemetery out in Kansas. Her brother-in-law is buried in North Carolina. I've got friends and relatives buried in different places all around the country, and so do you. And every one of them that was born again, every one of them that knows Jesus as personal as Savior, and Lord, when they die, their body is going to be resurrected with their soul. They're going to meet Jesus face to face. Those of us that may be left standing here on this earth, we're going to rise up to meet Him. And you've, you've heard the people sing the songs and the the different metaphors of how we're going to be driving and the car is going to be driverless and the plane's going to be pilotless and the office is going to be left with some still sitting there and others taken away. Well, I'm excited about that because it's going to be a literal coming. My Lord Himself is literally going to come back and take us to be with Him. It's going to be visible also. I'm glad I'm going to be able to see it. It's something I'm going to be able to see. You know, sometimes things just seem to elude us. I've had several people tell me the check's in the mail. I check that mail every day. Haven't got the check yet. Some things just elude us. But my friend, this is going to be visible. He said in Hebrews 9, 28, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. And in Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. It's going to be visible. It's something I'm going to be able to reach out and look at and to touch and to know that he has come back to take me home to be with him for eternity. And oh, it's going to be a glorious, glorious time. More glorious than any event that you and I have ever taken place in our lives. I've been to some big stadiums. Mary Ann's got tickets to the Braves game this week. Boy, she's going to see the Atlanta Braves. She's going to watch them whip the Mets, right? There's going to be 40,000, 50,000 people in those bleachers yelling and screaming. 
Mary Ann's going to get through the wave. First time she's ever been to a major league ball game. She, I'm going to look for her on TV doing the wave. I'm going to say, I know that woman that was just doing the wave. Because you get 40, 50,000 people together, they're excited. Unless you go with Buck. If you go with Buck, you sit so far up that you can't see for the birds flying below you. But otherwise, it's an exciting time. You go to a college game, there's 60, 70, 80,000 people cheering and doing all those things. And my friend, that's just for a ball game, and that's just 60, 70,000 people. Can you imagine when all of God's children, past and present, get together in the air and meet Him? What a glorious day that's going to be. What a cheer is going to erupt as Jesus Himself literally and physically comes back to take His children home. Listen to what the Bible says about that. What a glorious time it's going to be. Titus 2.13 says, I'm looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. You know how beautiful Jesus is going to be? The Bible tells us no man has looked upon his face. Because you see, he's so glorious that us human beings can't look upon his face. But one day we're going to see him face to face. That's going to be glorious. Matthew 16, 27 says, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all of them that believe. And when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all of the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, says Matthew 25, 31. Mark 8, 38 says, He cometh in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. And Luke 21, 27, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Oh, my friends, it's going to be a glorious time. It's going to be a time like you've never even imagined could be. Old song we used to sing years ago, What a day, glorious day that's going to be. And yet, sometimes we're just not excited as we should be about that glorious time. As Paul signed, or as John signed off, and he said, Even so, Lord Jesus, come on. He was ready. He was excited about it. As Paul was in the prison, I can't imagine but how those people that were also locked up in there says, You idiots down there. How can you be singing when you're locked up in prison? How can you be singing when you're chained to a guard? How can you be singing when they're getting ready to put you to death? What is wrong with you? And Paul was saying, oh, I don't worry about that because if I live, that's Christ. If I die, I gain because that's going to be a glorious day. And Paul didn't care about this earth. He cared about the glory of Jesus Christ and what it was going to be like on the day that Christ came back to take him home. My friends, it's going to be sudden. Yesterday we were going down the river. And as we were going down the river, one minute we were sitting in the canoe, the next minute I was thrashing around in the river. It was sudden. Becky was sitting in the front. She didn't even know what was going on. She said one minute she was breathing air, the next minute she was drinking river water. Just like that, all of a sudden, we were swimming in the twinkling of an eye. And that's just the way it's going to be. It's going to be sudden. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, even so the coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know how fast lightning is? Man, have you ever been on the river? And there didn't seem to be anything, and then all of a sudden, <coughs> it was there. Lightning is fast. You can't outrun it. You can't hide from it. Lightning is quick. In fact, when I was a little boy, my mama said I was faster than grease lightning. That's how fast lightning is, man. It is quick. And Jesus is going to come just like that. You know, some people are waiting for warnings. There's some folks say, I'm going to get saved when this, when that, before this, before that. Oh, my friend, don't wait because his coming is going to be sudden. It's going to be before you can blink your eye. Just like lightning, it's going to happen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
And then he tells us to be careful in Mark 13 unless we're found sleeping when Jesus comes back. You see, we've got to keep ourselves ready to go. Don't let down. Some of God's children say, well, I'm tired. I was over at the ball field yesterday. I saw some parents dragging. Kim had been out all day dragging around out there, swimming and, and paddling and carrying on. She got back to Crestview. Her husband called and said, Kim, we're in the playoffs. Come on down. Kim ran home, changed clothes, I reckon, got out of her wet, sandy clothes and headed for the ball field. Tired, but anticipating. Some of us are tired. Some have worked for 40 or 50, 60 years in the Lord's work. Some of us say, I think I'll just retire. Oh, no, my friends. Don't let him find us sleeping here. Don't let him find us letting down. Let's keep going as long as he gives us a breath, as long as he gives us the ability to move. Let's be ready because it's going to be sudden and we want to be about our Father's business when he comes back to get us. It's going to be unexpected. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, it says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We're not going to get any warning. You know, old Noah, he built that ark. Boy, he was out there building every day, getting a little gopher wood, cutting it up with his saw, and, and he was putting it together, put a little pitch in there, put a little asphalt and tar together, and got all those things and began to build and and every day the people come by and said, ha, ha, ha. And Noah said, well, it's going to rain one day. It's going to rain. And when it rains, the floods are going to come. You want to be ready. They walked away scoffing. The next day they came by and Noah was putting a few more boards on the ark. He said, it's going to rain. The floods are going to come. The earth's going to be destroyed. You want to be ready. And they walked away scoffing day after day, week after week, month after month. Until one day, the clouds opened up, the rains fell from the skies. And as we sang as little kids, the rains came down and the floods came up. And my friends, the houses that were built on sand began to fall. The lives of the scoffers were taken. Only those that knew Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, only those that he found righteous were saved at that time. All others were so surprised. My friend, it's going to come suddenly, and it's going to be a surprise to a lot of people. There's people that's going to have gone to church services, and they're going to hear Jesus' name preached and be told how to have Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, and they're going to walk out the door scoffing, say, I don't believe all that stuff. Why, he's a loving God. He's a God that's merciful. Oh, yes, he is. You know how I know he's loving? Because he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son. Do you know how I know he's merciful? Because he waited until I accepted him as personal Lord and Savior. He gave me that opportunity Sunday after Sunday. I know he's loving and I know he's merciful, but he's also a just God. And he's a jealous God. And he's giving you another opportunity today. Matthew 24, 39 says, They knew not until the flood came, and then their eyes were opened. But my friend, it was too late, because once their eyes were opened, the door of the ark was shut. In Genesis 19, 15, it says, The angels hastened Lot. You remember Lot? He was there in that wicked city. God says, I'm going to destroy it. And Lot was just taking his time. Boy, he was just taking his time, thought, I got plenty of time. And the angel said, get out now, it's going to happen. My friend, it's going to be sudden. We can't preach it enough, we can't teach it enough that it's going to happen and it's going to happen soon. And you and I need to be ready. Some of us think we're invincible. My friend, none of us are invincible. Got a call yesterday. Many of you play golf and you know BJ was managing over at Foxwood, then at Shoal Rivers, at Foxwood now. And yesterday, apparently, his teenage son was killed down on Highway 85. His car hit a tanker truck. The car and everything was burned beyond recognition. They're still waiting for a positive identification. His name was Christian. 
in talking to BJ for the last few weeks before he left over here, BJ had started going back to church. His wife and daughter had started going back to church. But they were having trouble getting Christian to go. And yesterday, he lost his life. My friends, we're not invincible. You can be 18 and have the world by the tail. You can have graduated from high school with honors. You can be accepted to the greatest school in the country or to FSU. You can be offered the greatest job. You can have a full scholarship. You can have the most beautiful home in Crestview, drive the finest car, have the prettiest wife, the handsomest husband, the best children. My friend, none of us are invincible. He's coming back. He's coming soon. He's coming sudden. He's coming in all of his glory. He's coming himself, literally. But he's only coming for one reason, and that's for his children. I ask you this serious question today. Are you one of his children? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Not have you heard of him. Not have you studied about him. Not even have you thought about him. But have you accepted Christ? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I want you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my personal Lord and Savior. I want to live my life serving, praising, and worshiping you. If you haven't, make that decision today. If he were to come today, if as the lightning, if the sky of the east would open and he would appear, he's going to bring that host of angels. As I understand God's word, there's three things going to happen. The king himself is going to shout a command. And then the archangel is going to summon the other angels. And then the trumpet's going to sound to awake the dead and to call the believers home. Are you ready to go? When God says, son, go get your children. When the archangel calls all the angels together and the skies open up and Jesus comes back and those angels are waiting, anticipating the arrival of the children of the king, will you be ready to go? Our hymn of invitation is where he leads me, hymn 288. Where he leads me, I will follow. My friend, when he leads me, I'll follow him to glory. Some of us won't even follow him down the aisle. Some of us won't even follow him for the first step. But my friends, those that follow him wherever he leads will see him in glory for eternity. I pray that today that will be you. Let's stand for our prayer. Then we'll have our invitation, and I pray that you will respond as God's Holy Spirit leads you. Lord, we know you're coming. We know you're coming in the twinkling of an eye. We know that it will be soon in your time and in your way. We know that one day, today, tomorrow, a year from now, but one day, the sky is going to open. And in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to come and gather your children. Lord, my prayer is that no one will leave this place today unless they're ready for that day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.